Well, good morning. I'm Ken Biberai, and welcome to Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. In the news today, President Biden has landed in Israel as tensions escalate in the region after a horrific attack at a hospital in Gaza. And the United States has announced that they are restricting the sale of advanced semiconductor chips to China. Today's topic is ranking academia in America. We are joined by Eric Gertler, the CEO and executive chairman of U.S. News and World Report. Good to see you, Eric. Good to see you. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. I, I can't believe you actually showed up and you're here. This is going to be wonderful. And good, is, and, <laughs> and good to see you again. It's been wonderful. a while. <laughs> well, it has been a while. And I think some folks remember this, but I was in New York for a long time, ran for office, got involved in the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. And even though you have this distinguished career as a CEO and running U.S. News, I still associate you as a public servant, as an active participant in the business community, advising mayors, multiple governors, and just being a thought leader. Tell us a little bit about your background and your attraction to public service and why it's so important to you. I think you're still involved at the Harvard Kennedy School, if I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. you've just been very active. Well, first of all, thank you for that 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 kind introduction. And uh, y you know, because of that kind introduction, I was gonna I was not gonna tell people. <laughs> that coffee with Ken is really water and that I had to bring all the muffins here this morning to to accompany the, you know, the water. But um, it, it was in the retainer agreement. You had to bring your own I, coffee, your own muffins. Exactly. You know? I didn't I didn't read it. But look, it um, it is a pleasure. And um, it, it was uh, a privilege being involved with public service um, in New York. And I still have a, a you know, a civic responsibility of ensuring that um, those talented individuals like yourself that leave New York need to come back. We need to talk about the tax base. So, um, but let's let you know. Let's get serious. It, it, it is uh, a privilege uh, to have served the people of New York. Um, certainly, in my last stint running uh, Empire State Development, which is the state's uh, principal economic development agency, um, I did that during uh, during COVID, and as uh, as as you know. COVID was first and foremost a health crisis, but it was also an economic crisis. And it is times like, like that in times of crisis where government plays its most important role. And to be able to uh, be involved with government, to be on the front lines, um, was really a privilege to be able to serve New Yorkers. So just on that for a second, you're the CEO of a company, a media organization, that's home, working remote, you're running a business, and then at the same time, you have this civic responsibility and duty. How did you juggle both? How important was it for you to be present, visible, and active wearing both hats at the no, same no, no. time? Let's I be mean, clear. that's gotta I, be... I, let, No, no, let's, yeah. let, let, let's be clear. I was not wearing both hats. I left US News, I took a sabbatical. I resigned from every board that I was involved with. Um, and you know those, those types of jobs at, at that level, um, are all demanding, and um, I didn't want I didn't want a conflict. Um, I wanted to be very focused, um, and that's the only way to do it. That's right. And a little bit of a bio. I mean, you're originally from Canada. Now you're here in the United States with a deep passion for public service. Tell us a little bit about your origin story and your family and coming here and, and about the American dream. Really, I mean, you're the CEO yeah. of a major media organization. So um, yeah, I grew I grew up in uh, in, in Montreal. Um, it, it was um, interestingly the the politics of Quebec that led me uh, to come to to the United States. Um, for those that understand and know the history of Quebec, there's been hundreds of years of tension between the French and, and the English. And when um, in the mid '70s the Parti Québécois was elected to government uh, under a platform to have Quebec separate from the rest of Canada. Uh, my parents were concerned about the future uh, economy um, in Quebec and, and what it may be and, and said to me, um, you know, go do well in school because uh, we're going to send you to school in the States. And, and it wasn't something that I thought of at the time. Um, you know, fast forward, I've made my life in the United States. One month after 9-11, so in uh, October of 2001, uh, I was sworn in as a, you know, nationalized American citizen. It was you know, a, you know, beautiful ceremony. Um, and I feel really blessed to be able to have um, this country citizenship. That's amazing. Well, you are uh, celebrating 90th anniversary yeah. at US News and World Report. Um, I think I saw in a recent interview, you described uh, 
U.S. news as kind of news you can use. So what, what does that mean? Well, I think that that's one part of, 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 of who we are. Um, and yes, it's, it's, our, it's our 90th anniversary. Um, U.S. News has been headquartered in Washington, D.C. for, for 90 years. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible to uh, be able to be at the helm of a business that's been around that long. And yet, we think of ourselves as a startup. We think of ourselves as a 90-year-old startup because we're always reinventing in, in, ourselves. Um, but, you know, to, to, to get to that news you can use, just to give you a little bit of context, U.S. News started in 1933 by David Lawrence. It was U.S. News. Uh, 13 years later, it was merged with World Report and became U.S. News and World Report. And for uh, those media buffs in your audience, in the 70s and 80s, the, the weekly news magazines played an important role in the media. So Time, Newsweek, U.S. News. Time was by far the largest with a readership of over 40 million. U.S. News was the smallest with a readership of about 12 million which meant that U.S. News had to think about ways of differentiating itself. And so at the back of the book, so not the front where there was news and stories about politics and what's going on around the world, U.S. News started to do stories of, of information to help consumers uh, with their lives. Um, we have now taken that, and, and by the way, that was very different than Time and Newsweek that did stories on entertainers and celebrities. And this was, again, information, news you can use. Today, um, we have uh, expanded that into ways in which we can help consumers make important life decisions, whether it's going to college or picking the right hospital, um, learning from the news that we do of how does that affect you, where, where should you live. So that's really been sort of the initial DNA of where we are uh, today as a company and a media organization. So what do the next 90 years look like, right? You've evolved, I think there's only a couple of versions in print, a lot of it's digital. How has how that ten, last 10 years kind of transformed how media is absorbed, right? I feel like there's just this disconnect. You look at how many people just get their news on Twitter and, and you look at it, what's happening right now in Israel, right? Like something happens and it's a knee-jerk reaction, news stories coming out, but are facts checked and, and so on, so. With respect to the news, um, we, we don't look at ourselves as a daily source of news information. We're certainly a news organization, but what we try to do is to give our readers context about what's going on, a sense of understanding, um, and a sense of what does this mean for you as, um, as the reader? How do we help you within, you know, within, your, uh, within your life? If we go back in the, you know, in, in the last 10 years, what, it, what became clear for us is that U.S. news and print did not work. It wasn't a viable business model. And actually, um, the opposite, the information that we were producing, um, rankings, and even the important journalism that we provide along with rankings, and not just colleges and hospitals, was much better uh, attuned for a digital audience. And so, um, as a company, we made the decision that, um, you know, and, and, and risky, um, we're going to forego the magazine and go all in on, on digital. Um, and it's worked. Um, and what, what we've, we've had to figure out is, how do we then engage a digital audience? How do we make sure that they, um, you know, in, in, in the case of rankings, um, uh, get, get that information, make it very accessible, to an audience, but also make sure that they're able to um, uh, uh, be empowered. So you're usually covering the news, sharing the news. You've been in the news a little bit lately as well. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the ranking system, some recent kind of, uh, not controversy, but attention. Yeah. Uh, what are people upset about? What are you dealing with now? Why are you in the news so much? Well, uh, I, I much prefer to be uh, having us covering the news. Um, but but sometimes you need to be in the news. And the reason why we as an organization and I was in the news is, um, you know, I think it's I, I, I believe that we provide an important service for students. Um, I believe that at a time when students are paying so much money to go to school, um, they are uh, assuming so much debt. There's lots of questions about 
you know, who's going to, you know, who's going to school. And and we as an organization play an important role in, in that by virtue of the rankings that we do. And certainly there's been criticism for many years. Um, but, you know, consumers come back year and year and year to uh, seek the information that we provide. We have over 100 million users that just go to our education site. So, um, you, you know, you can you can criticize everybody can criticize everything. But our rankings play an important role in helping students compare and contrast the universities um, that they're considering and the colleges that that they're considering. And also the stories that we write that surround the rankings, provide context, um, uh, give insights into the schools, help students think about, think about uh, debt. So, you know, the criticisms, you know, have been one slice of what we do and not a full picture of, of, of our, uh, of all the work uh, that we do in, in, in education. But, but, but I will say that um, as an organization, it's important that we listen to what um, uh, what organizations are saying and institutions are saying. Um, it's important that we are speaking with these institutions. I mean, after um, the uh, the law schools, uh, a number of them announced that they weren't going to submit the survey. Um, our team talked to 110 law school deans to understand the issues that they had. Now, let's remember the criticisms are coming from the schools. Mm -hmm. We do our work for the students, sure. and so it's it's a different sense of perspective. But if we're doing our job right, and reporters are being reporters, they need to listen to those institutions and hear what they have to say. But they're still going to get ranked, even if they don't want to fill out a survey, right? So you're still doing the work. Of ranking and, and of, tracking, right? of 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 course, yeah. I think I think that we have an important service to provide for 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 students, and so we are going to continue to rank these institutions. We think that it's better when the institutions um, are providing more and accurate information, so that students have one place to go. Now, and I'm not saying the only place. I'm saying one place where students can compare and contrast and learn. Perhaps go to you know uh, you know uh, uh, other places. It's too big of a decision for these students just to rely on any one organization. Uh, more often than not, we see students start with us, um, but um, it, it 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 is important that that um, institutions and colleges and universities and graduate schools understand that students want and demand this information. Parents want this information. And what we want to do is make sure it's the best um, information for students and when they make that decision. So talk a little bit about the methodology. Clearly, the rankings are a large part of the service you're providing. Um, I'm sure the resources behind it make up a large component of yeah. your organization in general. So how has the methodology changed? How has the focus on maybe the data points evolved, whether it's you know quality of life or debt, yeah. employment afterwards? How are you constantly staying ahead? You're a startup, right? Like how are you staying ahead of the data points that matter most to the end user? So in in each of our rankings, the methodologies have evolved over the years. Um, if if we look at at colleges, um, our editors um, uh, and writers are very attuned to what is going on. Um, in the community, in the country. Uh, if you think about it, 40 years ago, the U.S. News and World Report started its rankings of colleges 40 years ago. So we have a team that has seen um, everything over, over, over that period of time. And 40 years ago, the rankings were based on just reputation surveys. And today, reputation surveys represents about 20% and, and declining. But most importantly for these rankings, what, what, what we have done is we, we listen, we learn from students, parents, educators. And what students want now is they want to understand the outcomes related to, to the education. Students are very concerned about the diversity of students going to the campus. They're concerned about assuming manageable debt, manageable debt. And, um, and they're concerned about 
what are the outcomes related to 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 college? We're living in a time when um, you know there's 1.6 trillion dollars of student debt. These kids who are looking at colleges are very concerned about burdening themselves with debt for the rest of their lives, and so there's a different equation that's being done. And when you look at our methodology, we take it that you know in you know into account. Um, now, the great colleges are still doing well, um, you know, on the on on the rankings. Um, you, you know, this year there was uh, some attention focused on some of the public universities have done well, but again, um, we do the rankings for students, and it's a reflection of what is on the minds of of, of students. And in this case, worry about debt, um, worry about outcomes and getting jobs, and also um, this year in the methodology was also focused on um, uh, you know other. Other elements like first generation, first generation students going mm -hmm. to these schools. What I think is so interesting about your background is you were at economic development. You were focused on revitalizing New York City and New York State. You're tracking and ranking educational institutions. The kind of connectivity I see really here is around the future of work, the workforce, ensuring America is competitive. How do you think about some of those macro challenges as you look at rankings, for example, right? Like if we have a massive new industrial uh, initiative in the United States with reshoring and AI and technology. How are you thinking about these things happening with the workforce as it relates to even rankings? I mean, do you, do you adjust the rankings, taking into consideration maybe future macro domestic needs from a workforce? Well, I, I think with respect to the rankings, we're, we're trying to, and what we strive for is um, a, a rankings that is um, focused on first and foremost helping students make that 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 decision. There's lots of there's lots of noise that's that that that's going around, um, but we're trying to do um, our you know we have a responsibility. We're we're a, um, a media company that um, that we know every year, um, depending upon the rankings, there's tens of millions of users that are relying on us for our trusted advice. Um, and we take that very seriously. And so in that area, we're looking at what are those elements that are most important making that decision. There's lots of other things that are going on. And you know those issues on workforce um, are incorporated in some of the other rankings that, you know, that we do. You know, I, 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 I might add that, um, when you think about today and how consumers consume information, there's not one way that consumers digest information. Certainly, over time, um, the most traditional way is a story that's traditionally been in a newspaper that's um, that's written. We know from um, from what we've seen and from what our consumers want. Um, sometimes they want bullet points. Sometimes they want to see data charts. Sometimes they want a story. Um, we also know that providing rankings is a an important and easily digestible way for students to um, to help them with their journey going through colleges or another buying decisions depending upon potentially let's say in travel where they sure. want to go. So it's just another way um, that we provide information um, and data and 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 know that when we do our rankings, the amount of time and effort that our team, the expertise that they use to do that um, is really un unrivaled. Um, the, the, the journalism, I mean, on these rankings, there there are, I think in when we did our rankings on um, best countries, a billion pieces of data. So there's lots that we incorporate. Um, and so in, in, in that respect, we are also a data and, and technology company today. So I think that's a good segue. There's a lot of discussion today about AI using technology. As you're evaluating rankings and collecting data points and providing the best kind of uh, actionable information for students and consumers, how are you investing in technology and AI? And how, what role is that going to play in future rankings or diligence that you do? Um, I think the easiest way to answer that is that it's too early to tell. There's no doubt that AI will play an important and, and an even more important role. Um, I just don't know yet. We are experimenting as a company. We've been very reluctant to introduce AI into 
uh, into our stories, for example. We've seen other media companies do that and um, lots of criticisms of plagiarism and, and so on. So uh, we're being very careful. We're, we're testing it on our consumer experience. Um, but I think right now it's it's go slow for the consumer, but go fast in terms of our learnings and internal testing. Um, I think it'll have an effect ultimately on how we do the rankings, on the efficiency. Uh, there'll be lots of ways that it'll improve the consumer experience. But right now, um, in order to maintain our values of trust and accuracy and context, it's not quite ready for prime time for us. We're sitting in the offices of a crisis communication shop here at Rational 360. When news broke that you were getting pushback on rankings from you know, Yale and Harvard and so on, from the business, I'm sorry, from the law schools and medical schools, this was an opportunity to, to react for you to get out there. And it seems like you've had a very hands-on approach to, to responding to the situation, writing op-eds, commenting in media, being very visible. Talk a little bit about that. Like, what lessons did you learn even dealing with this and being on the other side of the news in terms of responding and crisis communication and leadership and, and so on? Um, so I think that the way I looked at it um, is rankings was core to who we are as an organization. And so um, understanding that, I knew that I needed to speak for the company because it really was... Um, you, you know, an area of what we do that expands across across the company. Um, the other thing is, and and we're uh, you know very fortunate. We have an outstanding communications team who are able to provide great counsel. Um, I mean, they got you on coffee with Ken, so clearly, uh, clearly, clearly, I don't know, I don't know how they did that. They, yeah, you know, I mean. we'll we'll see afterwards whether you know it was a good decision or not. But that's a whole other issue. But um, the the other thing is that in in doing it we needed to be very clear about who we are and why we do the rankings. And um, at the core of why we do that is to help our consumers. And um, and what, what, what this you know, whole issue reinforced for that is to go back to our core message, to go back to our core DNA of who, who are we and what do we do. And let's stick to that. And um, and that makes it very easy um, in, in that sense because um, it's something that is absolutely authentic to who, to who we are and what we do every single day. Now, that's not to say that it's um, uh, a lot of fun answering these questions. Um, it's very personal when people are criticizing the core of, of, of what we do and, um, and, uh, and we take it seriously, but I think for us, it was looking at our North Star and saying, we do important work, we do it well, and we do it for our consumers. So let's just continue to just reinforce that. Yeah, because it seemed like a pretty pretty high profile and coordinated kind of pushback. So I'm wondering, did you lean more on your experience from politics and dealing with New York or more on being Canadian to, to respond? What, do you, what, 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 what was the most helpful? I, th I think any any crisis is a product of all the experiences that you had. Um, certainly, being on coffee with Ken is going to be added to the experiences that I've had, and you know, in dealing with future crises. But, but uh, you know, in, in in all seriousness, I think it just it you have to really in this case um, think about what is most important and and who do we stand for. And if you're being you know sincere about that. Um, and recognizing where we need to be and where we want to go, then um, then at least we know we're doing the right thing. And, and people may say otherwise. And you know, in every in, in every case, not just in our in every business, there's always other people that um, criticize you or say things that you don't agree with. But at least if you know that you're true to who you are, and, and, and I think we were as an organization, then at least you can wake up in the morning and feel good about it. And look, I imagine it was a challenge going through with Lifetime, but wasn't it also an opportunity, a kind of chance for you to, to re-articulate the values, the mission, the importance of rankings, why you do it, and highlight the methodology behind it? I mean, I'm a bit of an optimist, right? So even in a crisis, yeah. it seems like this could actually have been a, a great moment for US News to really amplify what you've done for 40 years 
what you're doing on a 90th anniversary, why creating actionable news is important for folks. You know, certainly I think that, that you know, we're here in Washington, D.C., then there's an expression, you know, along lines of, a, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you in, in, in the midst of it, um, we weren't thinking about, is this an opportunity to retell our story? It really was about how do we reinforce, you know, who, you know, who we are. I think at the end of the day, I think it's turned out that our story has been told. Um, but, um, you know, my preference is certainly, you know, going back to the day to day business and waiting, you know, by the phone for Ken to call me um, and, and, you know, do and, you know, do these do these types of interviews. Well, on that note, Eric Gertler, always great seeing you, my friend. And uh, congratulations on all the success on the 90th anniversary. And while you're dealing with a lot, uh, it really does seem like an opportunity for folks to kind of revisit these important topics of accountability, data, information, and decision making. Well, you're quite kind. And uh, thank you for having me on your show this well, morning. I really appreciate it. And thank I appreciate you. everyone tuning in. Uh, you can catch up on Eric's conversation, past conversations, and future ones on coffeewithken.com. We're also on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Google Play. We are live next week on the 25th with Aaron Koop with a topic called The Power of Now. Looking forward to it. Take care, everyone.